So yeah, we're gonna get back to talking about BSP layers again. Uh, I have a slightly different approach to what's, what's earlier presented. So I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, the individual components that consist in a BSP. So what typically is inside a BSP uh, and some uh, tips and tricks maybe on how to optimize them to your specific use case, because typically what you get from a BSP layer is not necessarily what you want to end up to use on your device. Uh, so we're going to take a look uh, a bit on that. Uh, so yeah, look at the different components, optimizations, and then at the end a bit about BSP layers again. Uh, you already know this, so we can start with the bootloaders. Uh, so every BSP has some kind of bootloader. Uh, in our case, typically, so x86, uh, it has in, uh, it works on in new boot as well, but uh, typically not used there. So on our MIPS PowerPC RISC V, uh, we use U-Boot, and that's part of the OE core. There's also an alternative bootloader, Bearbox. Uh, and a U-Boot, typically every board has a spe specific configuration, and then there is code as well for every board that does specific in it. Uh, on x86 it's a bit more standardized, uh, so there is a, uh, typically you have something called UFI applications now, so Grub is a UFI application, systemd boot, uh, or you can boot the Linux kernel directly if you have the, the config EFI stuff com compiled in, then you kind of can bypass using Grub entirely and just uh, and it's pretty standardized so in U-Boot or in, uh, in ARM which is the most common uh, in this space there's a bit more flexibility so to say so I looked a bit uh, the open embedded layer index is a good resource to look up stuff so I actually counted so there are right now 100 plus U-Boot recipes or U-Boot targets so this uh, that was mentioned earlier, uh, we at Mender we integrate with U-Boot, and there is over 100 U-Boot recipes to integrate with. So it's hard to get uh, get it that works 100%. And a lot of these uh, recipes are uh, U-Boot forks. So essentially every vendor uh, forks U-Boot, uh, even if even if they are supported mainline. Uh, that's something that I see quite often, that, uh, yes? So I have obvious option, like, is your integration so board specific that you cannot just put it in the mainline, have it there, and then stop reintegrating it? No. So it's very generic, and it's something that, yeah, we have discussed internally as well. Uh, that maybe we should do it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's something that we probably should do. Uh, initially, we changed the integration changed quite a lot. Uh, but now it's been pretty stable uh, for a while. And maybe that's why we didn't integrate it initially. Uh, but I mean, what we do is integrate with the boot command. So it's not like... Uh, Feel free to talk to me. Yeah, you can talk to me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and most of these are, there, there's forks and there's multiple versions, and versions dating back to 2012. Uh, mm -hmm. And this becomes problematic, of course, uh, if you are building a solution that tries to integrate with. Uh, so the U-boot provided by a BSP layer. Uh, so if you look, for example, on, on even good layers, so Metal Raspberry Pi or one of the good ones, uh, the U-boot configuration that you get is typically bloated or it contains a lot of things. Uh, I mean, a focus more on ease of use, so when you build it, you kind of have a working system. Uh, but there is a lot of things there that you should take a look at. Uh, so when you're building a product, uh, you want to strip down this configuration to remove things that you will not use. Typically stuff like USB or Ethernet, which is quite useful during development. Uh, but it's maybe not something that you want to ship into your product uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and I mean, less is always better, uh, especially in a bootloader. The bootloader is supposed to get you from boot to the next stage, right? So it shouldn't uh, shouldn't have much, too much logic in there to do do things. Uh, distro boot command is a great kit, great thing, uh, which is 
which helps you probe different uh, storage mediums. So you can boot from EMC, SD card, USB, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, but it kind of wastes uh, CPU cycles or wastes time on probing. So if you are building a product, you typically know that I'm booting from the EMMC. So you don't need it to probe different storage mediums. Uh, but this boot command also tries to try di tries different boot routes. So pick Pixie boot. It tries to find the boot script. Uh, it tries to find the UFI application and all of these things. And typically, you already know uh, which kind of files you're looking for. So you don't really need the probing in a in an end product. And there is all the obvious boot delay, which is typically set when you kind of consume BSP layers. So you have a boot delay of three seconds. Uh, that's like uh, an easy thing to fix and to, to kind of speed up the boot and the whole product experience. Uh, console is typically enabled by default. And normally it's on serial and uh, graphical interfaces. and. Uh, so you have output on serial and LCD and uh, input on serial and USB keyboard. So if you don't remove the USB keyboard, keyboard, someone can connect the USB keyboard to your device and halt your bootloader basically. Uh, so that's a, some kind of like optimizations that you need to take a look at uh, before you uh, build it into your product, uh, disabling inputs. And in some cases, uh, you might want to have a, like a development build uh, for your bootloader where you, where you want networking and USB and stuff so you can easily load uh, test images. Uh, but these features really should be disabled once you start uh, doing a production build uh, of the bootloader. Any questions on this or comments from the U boot uh, guy? So you want to like circumvent all this like machinery in the U boot and all that, that blows and stuff? you have a look at the ability of the U-Boot SPL to actually start the Linux kernel directly as opposed to pop and load? Yeah. Like the SPL basically initializes the RAM, puts the kernel into your RAM, jumps to it, that's it. Mm. Yeah, I'm familiar with the Falcon mode and it's definitely... So maybe that's what you kind of want to do to avoid all the distro boot uh, and even like starting the U-Boot itself. Yeah. You can, yeah, you can bypass starting your boot entirely and just use the SPL to boot. Yes. Just may, maybe the, then you kind of get rid of this automatically. And yeah. you can actually keep all this functionality if you ever need to do some sort of advanced stuff in the boot loader. Hmm. You can have like a press, press key key button to, to, boot, boot, yeah. Yeah. to start the. the yeah, some security implications maybe to yeah, uh, having a like a... If, if your button is inside the case, somehow hidden there, <coughs> yeah. that would be a hole in your case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hole in your case. But yeah, definitely, Falcon Boost is definitely a good thing to, like a good optimization. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. No! <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Please do. Uh, so, uh, Typical part of the uh, BSP, uh, we have the two chain and the libc. This is somewhat abstracted in uh, Open Embedded, uh, but traditionally, this is uh, yeah. You, you need a tool chain that is for your target device. So you can uh, either so you can cross compile the binaries for your application, and uh, a tool chain typically consists of uh, bin utils, a compiler, a debugger. You need a, a sysroot if you are cross compiling. So you have the cross compiling uh, cross binaries uh, with debug symbols. Uh, and then you need some kind of C library uh, where there are a couple of options. Uh, Muscle and glibc has already come up today, but there are other alternatives as well. Uh, and this is kind of what consists, of, this is what you get with Open Embedded Core, it kind of builds this for you. Uh, but I wanted to just mention that there are a lot of like uh, pre-built toolchains provided by different uh, vendors or projects. So you can uh, easily download uh, to cross toolchains for a specific target. So there's one on free electrons. Uh, they have pretty much all the architectures and you can also have the option of choosing the libc. So glibc, muscle and microlibc uh, supported by them. Uh, 
Lenaro has for a long time built optimized toolchains for ARM, so you can download a pre-built toolchain and just get started. Uh, and there is some, some, uh, for example, in Debian you have cross tools, so you can essentially install uh, toolchain as well. Uh, and then you can already there are a couple of toolchain build systems. Uh, cross tool ng uh, is a tool to build toolchains, uh, highly flexible, and it can build all kinds of combinations and uh, it gets quite complex to do it. Uh, and we obviously have OpenMPN and Core, which is a toolchain builder as well. Uh, and the option that we have in uh, OpenMPN is glibc and muscle. Um, MicroLibc was there in full earlier, but it was removed in favor of muscle or maybe, yeah, I don't know exactly when it was, but uh, it was removed for various reasons. Mm. Looking at optimizations, toolchains are, as I mentioned, not really uh, a BSP uh, provided thing, uh, even though they are like Metal in Aro, which provides uh, their own toolchain. Uh, so there are, uh, but it's typically built into the open embedded core and it's built for you. But there are some, some optimizations that you can do to how this toolchain is built. Uh, so typically the approach is you, you, Picking if you want to have a generic uh, toolchain or optimized toolchain, and this comes with some benefits and drawbacks. For example, the Debian toolchains are generic uh, for ARM hardflow, uh, and specifically it works on I think ARM v7 with a certain floating point unit, but no neon support, for example. Uh, and this you can control in Open, Embed open Embedded Core uh, with the, the default tune variable which is not something typically that's set in a BSP layer or should not be uh, set in a BSP layer. And it's kind of a decision for the distribution to decide how to compile uh, the binaries, if they are going to be optimized for a specific target or if they're going to be generic. Uh, one of the drawbacks of having a very optimized toolchain builds uh, is to, uh, you cannot reuse uh, SS state cache. Uh, so if you are very heavily optimized, then you kind of have to rebuild everything for different targets. Uh, and you also have the option uh, to go glibc or muscle, uh, big versus small. Uh, you sacrifice maybe some performance with muscle. But nowadays, the benchmarks I looked at, they are pretty on par uh, in a lot of cases. So you don't really sacrifice that much performance by going smaller memory allocation is a thing i've recently seen people yeah. arguing about on hacker news yeah that's definitely a thing that's better in glibc yeah. then you also have uh, <clears throat> the compiler is an option so you, by default is gcc uh, you have a meta clang layer so you can use clang as well uh, and clang is actually better or they focus a lot on optimizing big compile times so you should, it's an uh, optimization on uh, build time as well uh, of using uh, Clang. Again, maybe you're sacrificing some uh, runtime performance by using uh, Clang, but they're not that far off nowadays, uh, according to the benchmarks, or be benchmarks at least. Um, any questions, comments? Yeah, same slide. Linux kernel. <laughs> That's also part of the uh, BSP, right? Uh, and I, again, I looked at the Open Embedded Layer Index, and this is, has even more targets. So I found around 250 uh, Linux kernel targets or recipes, uh, forks, multiple versions, variants. It's very common to have a RRT uh, recipe and then kind of have a stable. And then, so there's a lot of kernel recipes. Uh, uh, and again, uh, but typically what you would maybe optimize or uh, as a consumer of a BSP, you might modify the device tree or the dev config. You don't rarely do source code uh, changes unless you are doing very specific uh, development. Uh, And again, this is like customizing the dev config uh, 
a lot of the times the dev config that you get from a BSP layer is very full featured, it contains everything is enabled basically, so you definitely want to go in there and disable things you're not using. It's very common that debug features are enabled, so debug symbols, tracing features, and so on. Uh, these All these features have of performance overhead uh, that you need to take, kind of evaluate if you, if you need them in your in product and you typically want to disable them. Uh, and you typically want to go through uh, built-in versus modules. Uh, I mean, an embedded device in most cases is a fairly static thing. So what's connected to it is during production. Uh, so you don't have so much dynamic loading of things later on. But still mo modules make sense in some cases as well. If you are optimizing boot, then you might want to have some uh, things uh, compiled as modules. So they got, get loaded later and not during uh, the kernel boot. Um, yeah. Any comments on this one? Questions? Yeah, and I kind of get to the last thing that's part of the uh, BSP. Major majority of the boards have some kind of firmware, uh, firmware blobs that you need to, ac uh, to have to access certain functionality. Uh, so common interfaces that require blobs are GPUs or uh, VPUs. Uh, but this is highly uh, SOC specific and depends on what uh, IP you're using. Uh, you have the Linux firmware, uh, which is firmware for Wi Fi, and in some cases also audio chips. Uh, but there's not so much to optimize here. You need to use the firmware blobs to get the full functionality of the hardware you're using, so you cannot do much. Besides, maybe make sure that you don't install the whole Linux firmware package because it contains a lot of firmware uh, blobs and you're probably just using one or two that's part of your repository. And looking at coming back at the uh, BSP layers, uh, as I said, uh, this is a great resource to look up layers, but <laughs> what I found is right now we have 100 BSP layers, pretty exact. I tried, I tried to filter something so that came up on my search so and eventually I got up to 100. Uh, I didn't go through them too much to see how many are active or maintained but it would be a fun exercise to see how how many of them are actually relevant. Uh, some are definitely for obsolete hardware that no one is using or cannot buy and I found one <laughs> meta bug and the last commit was in 2012. Uh, so that's Definitely do to, to, to some cleaning uh, or possibilities to clean up. And I think that's what I had. Uh, and if you want, you can continue. We have some time. Uh, it's kind of the, this was the discussion we were having earlier. Um, what can we do on uh, the of this list and uh, to make it more clear what's active, what's inactive, uh, red flagged, uh, removed. I mean, Metabug, I don't know, I don't know the history behind that, but that's definitely something that's of no interest to anyone <laughs> that that layer exists. Uh, so yeah, comments, uh, or? <laughs> no, there are people in the room who know about Metabug. Oh yeah? Can someone share the story? What is it? The main thing is not you. Mark, did you work for Bug? Oh, he's asleep. Oh, asleep. <laughs> Metabug. Sorry. Metabug? Yeah. He should die. <laughs> <laughs> it's alive. It's, it's, listed, alive. it's, it's listed, listed on the open embedded layers. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Here we go. A friend asked me to bring some embedded junk to a meeting, I looked at my drawers, I took two bugs from it, both were nearly twice as fat as before, I took a screwdriver and batteries were like bigger than Nokia, than Nokia phones, right? It's like one, one and a half centimeters thick battery, 
which was less than 5 millimeters originally. So I took the batteries out and took them with me to show how battery looks after six hours in non-powered device. <laughs> so yeah, if it is still in layers, please bring it. <laughs> we'll figure out how to do that. <laughs> Are you still in the tank yet? Nah, bug labs don't work. Bug labs don't work on bugs on bug devices for <laughs> probably 2013. Sounds like a, a, a target for moving from the uh, the, the, the open bedded uh, layer emitter. And it runs for 16 probably. If it, but I don't remember is meta bug for bug one or for bug. Two, there are two different devices. Bug one was EMX 55. Wait, or do you want it? No. <laughs> and second, what? The second was Oma. Oh, three, I think. Both have a uh, uh, three Is it both in the layer? Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Maybe it still works. Maybe nice. someone tries it. <laughs> I had to point out that. Someone who knows something about bug is in the room. Yeah. yeah, I mean, definitely all of the layers have some kind of history and someone knows about them. But, uh... I have to admit, I don't even remember how, what kind of quality it was. It was a long time ago. Because 2012 was definitely not my stuff. I stopped, I stopped working on it on bugs in 2010. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, you mentioned that uh, embedded hardware is generally static, but what about embedded FPGAs and like embedded like stackable hardware? What about that? What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean a lot of uh, like development boards, so Raspberry Pi, it's, you can buy hats and connect stuff. Uh, but if you are building a product, yeah. uh, you typically okay maybe put a hat on the Raspberry Pi, but you won't make it changeable later, right? Well, what about yeah, but that's definitely uh, a different use case that you want to change maybe more often. Uh, it suddenly becomes non-static, really. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a, the hardware suddenly becomes non-static. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't have any comments on that. Really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, eventually you end up I'm done if there's okay. no more. So, Chris is now going to explain. Yep, thank you.